Hello and welcome. There's no gain saying the fact that Nigeria's growth has slowed on account of uh, receding crude oil prices and perceived economic uncertainties. But while the business environment still remains challenging, diverse sources of economic growth still exist for the discerning. Key growth areas include telecoms, trade, hospitality and agriculture. Official source statistics show that agriculture remains the largest contributor to the Nigerian economy, accounting for about 40% of GDP and providing employment for about 70% of the labor force. In Agri, we're told that Nigeria has only about 40% of its arable land under cultivation. Meanwhile, we're also told that billions of dollars of scarce foreign exchange are spent on importing food annually. Last year, about $11 billion, or about 2.1 trillion naira, was spent on importing wheat, rice, sugar, and fish alone. Nigeria's population of over 117 million people is youthful and provides a huge pool of skills. It also provides huge internal market for consumption. So why has it been difficult for people to understand that agriculture will solve at least two of our pressing national problems, that of food security and unemployment? And what is the agricultural community doing to leverage on the opportunities provided by the seeming economic adversity? To help us make sense of all of this, I am being joined today by Mr. Emmanuel Ijewere, Coordinator, Nigeria Agribusiness Group. Thank you, Mr. Ijewere, for joining us. Thank you. Let me quickly get you acquainted with my guest before we start our conversation. Born on 30th October 1946, Mr. Emmanuel Ijewere studied at the University of London where he got a degree in economics. He started his accountancy career with Coopers and Librand. He then became a partner at Dio Dafinone & Co and later founded Ijewere & Co, a firm of chartered accountants and tax consultants. He is a past president of accounting bodies of West Africa, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria and the Institute of Directors. Mr. Ijewere is also a past president of Nigeria Red Cross Society and chairman of West African Subregion of International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. He sits on the board of several companies as chairman and director, including Best Foods Group, Computer Warehouse Group, Apex Capital and Trust Limited. Mr. Ijewere has served the country in several capacities, including as chairman of the Modified Value Audit Tax Committee, Chairman of the Agriculture and Food Security Commission of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group, member of the Agricultural Implementation Council, member of the Technical Committee on Privatization of Federal Government Companies and Paras Titles, and member of the National Economic Council. Forty years after uh, the government of uh, General Obasanjo introduced uh, the Operation Feed the Nation policy. We're still talking about food self-sufficiency. How is it, is it for agriculture to become the mainstay of the economy and how can we use agriculture to end hunger, create wealth and drive equitable economic growth? You know, when did the history of 40 years ago all those intervention policies that were put in place were very well intentioned and they worked briefly but they were not sustainable because they were supply based in a sustainable economy it must be demand based let the end user determine what he wants so a lot of effort went into production 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 yes there were a lot of inefficiencies in our production system. But nevertheless, there was advantage in numbers. We had a large population that, that, that was dedicated to agriculture, to farming, and so on and so forth. Consequently, they were producing a lot of foodstuff, which people did not really notice. The reason why we have problems about food is not because of lack of production. Because it's been estimated on hindsight that we were producing well over 130 percent of the food we needed to eat. 130 percent. Yes, but over 60 to 65 percent of that food got wasted. Never got to the dining table. Never got to your table. Never got to your kitchen. And that was because the value chain was in a mess. 
after you have produced, the, even the mode of harvesting itself was a challenge. The mode of preservation, because you must start preserving immediately you harvest. As you pointed out, post-harvest yes. losses are still very high. Yes, very, very high. Uh, what needs to happen to stop the waste and so farmers can reap the full reward of their labor? First, the policy must come up from a, a demand base. Those that require it must be the ones that say we need it. This is the quantity we need. This is when we are collecting it. This is how we are collecting it. Those ones will not take responsibility for the preservation and for the storage. Rather than the farmer who has produced and the other disadvantage for the farmer is that most of these farmers don't have the advantage of those who are involved in the selling of the product in terms of financial capability, in terms of knowledge, in terms of exposure, and so on and so forth. So that is what is beginning to change now that will now start addressing that fundamental problem, the wrong angle from where we came in before. And that, thank God this minister has said so. As you pointed out, Nigeria is trying to become an agro-processing country, yes. but infrastructure remains a big challenge. Yes. Uh, how much delay will this cause on the journey to food self-sufficiency? Yes, we agree that there, there are a lot of um, infrastructural problems and challenges. But as of today, if only we could reduce our post-harvest losses through a more efficient system. These are not things that government is expected to do. It's the private sector is supposed to do that. The first thing we need to do is to bring people's consciousness to the opportunities that exist in agribusiness. It's a profitable business. It's a business that is sustainable. It's a business that anybody can go into. And we need to also change the psyche of people when they hear agriculture, the first thing that comes to their mind, and the only thing that sticks into their mind, is farming. Farming is only a small part of the entire value chain. A lot of people are in farming already. Over 45 million Nigerians are in farming. But very few people are in the real value chain, like the preservation, like the semi-processing. Like even, even in the farming aspect of it, a company can set up to do nothing else but just help prepare the land. That's 70% of the hard work of these are poor farmers in the villages. So we're just saying that bring the opportunities of agribusiness along the entire value chain to the consciousness of people. And that's beginning to happen because you have a lot of young graduates coming and making inquiries, those who never thought before. And God in his infinite wisdom has also given Nigeria a challenge by taking away this oil issue. Absolutely. The renaissance in agriculture is coinciding with the drop in, in yes. oil price, in oil revenues. What can we do to seize the moment and promote, for example, cash crops production? Yes. Cash crop production, to a large extent, are in a relatively, relatively advantageous position. Because most of those who are in cash crops are better educated than those who are into the basic farming and into the short-term farming like Things like horticulture and so on and so forth. Um, but the, those into, uh, you have, let me give an example of where some of the problems are. Benue State, for example, is one of the biggest producers of oranges. I send my truck to go and bring a truckload of oranges from Benue State, just outside Makodi. It gets there, the owner of the, of the orchard now gets five young men. They climb the trees, climb five different trees, and they shake. And where the oranges fall on the ground, over 30 percent of those oranges are damaged. Even the ones that don't look damaged just by sight, by the time you put them in the lorry bringing them to Lagos, they had already been damaged inside. It does not take time before they start going rotten when they arrive at mile 12 market or any of the markets. Those are things that need to be ad looked at. And these are not very complicated things. I'm bringing this as an example. All you need to do is to bring tarpaulin and put it under the tree. Under the tree. Four people hold the tarpaulin. It drops on it. It saves. And not more than 5% will be lost. These are the practical things that can be done only by people who are exposed. And many of the people who are exposed are not in agriculture. We are not in agriculture. But thank God. Many are more and more people. Maybe one day you will join 
those who are going to agribusiness. It's so believed that the poorest livelihoods are found in agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, what can be done to make agri more attractive to those kinds of people who would think outside the box? Those kind of people, fortunately, exist. And a lot that is happening now are not what they are getting from talking to people like me. Because I have been in the internet, I can tell them what to do and where to go. But many of them go on the internet. This internet issue is such a big source of information. There's almost nothing you will not find in the internet. The one I was telling you just now about using the tarpaulin, I got it because it was used, I saw it on the internet. It was being used in Colombia. And we tested it in Makodi, and it worked. So a lot of it, we, because we don't have a history of generation father to son, son to grandson agriculturists. What we have done is that a cultural development between 1960 and now is virtually frozen because their children did not take over from them because of the perception that farming and poverty are synonymous. But we're now trying to reverse that. How do you reverse that? By showing them how things were done wrong and how you can do it right and how you can make money doing exactly the same thing and improving on it. We have to take a break now. Please join us again.